First of all, since I'm the last Fedor talk, I want to emphasize something that I think is really important about the Faders. This is wrong. <laughs> it's not about good or bad. It's about taking a choice between two different ways of making a good or a bad game. Um, and of course you might laugh because it could be fun. Anyway, Game Master style. First things first, what is a Game Master? Um, I think this is really important to agree on what a Game Master is and what a Game Master does. Um, and to help with this, I will use a, dis a distinction between <coughs> the Game Master and the Game Writer. The Game Writer writes the game and produces uh, some kind of, of, of manual or script that the uh, Game Master then can use to uh, perform the game or um, to explain the game to the players. Of course, sometimes you can both be a Game Master and a Game Writer, and often this is the case in LARP. Um, yeah. What the Game Master does is that the Game Master uh, pushes the game in different directions based on what the Game Writer has written him to do. Uh, and sometimes the Game Master can improvise in different directions to uh, enhance the experience. Um, yeah. And OK, we'll talk a lot about how to do that. Uh, yeah, and then you can, you can actually write a game and then somebody else can run it or Game Master it. Also very important, I want to explain uh, the word or the idea of an NPC, a non-player character. A non-player character is, of course, a non-player. Um, so this could be either like a GM or, um, or an, uh, a sort of an actor for the Game Master. So, the example being the orcs in the forest, the game master tells in this fantasy game, send in all the orcs! And then the orcs storm the village and kill everybody. Um, <coughs> and the orcs are not, um, they're not actually players because they're just commanded to go in and do something and then they go out of the game again. So they have no real character progression or role. Um, and they are also the eyes and the ears of the game master. So they find, um, they find out how the game is progressing, and then goes back to the game master and explains him, uh, we need more of this and that. And then there's a, a phrase that we use, or more or less used a lot in Denmark, called the plot hammer. And the plot hammer is the concept of you smashing some kind of narrative or story onto the game. So the example being, again, the orcs, they push the game in a, in a specific direction and you hammer this into the game because the players cannot, they cannot flee from the orcs, they cannot ignore the orcs. The orcs go in and then kill everybody. <laughs> so they have no choice, it's forced upon them. Um, yeah, and then there's uh, different kind of game styles. Ogre will also explain more about it. But there's an active game, which is the, also the top of the fader, talking about active and passive, but there's an active game which is in the room of the game, telling the players what is happening and what they have to do and how they have to react and always like all train stuff. Then there's the passive GM, or which is more like someone who runs a workshop, explains the game, and then let the players do their thing. So they have like control of the whole game. Um, and then there's the blind GM, where you can, you're in another room, and then there's the uh, and then there's like the game in one room and you're in another room so you can't see what was actually happening. Um, but then you can use the NPC from before or maybe using lights or different mechanics to alter and push the game in different directions. But you cannot see the game, which is quite important in, in some situations uh, to be aware of. Then there's the playing GM where you're actually part of the game and you're playing a character just like anybody else. But you might sometimes step out of character and then alter the game while playing. Um, I usually will not recommend you to be a playing game master because usually there is a lot of other things that you have to think about than playing the game. And both playing the game and also game mastering it is really tough to pull off in a successful way. 
except if it's like a really like simple game. And then there can of course be no GM. Somebody can write a game, they can hand the paper out in a room to some players, then they pick up the game, they read their character, and they read this in the, the setting, and then they just play the game. Um, yeah. So, the players. There is the active end, with the GM being very into your face and telling you what to do, or it could be the an example is uh, when, uh, destinies meet. when destinies meet. Thank you. Um, where the GM is a part of the game and altering anything and always like manipulating stuff and uh, turning, <coughs> altering the game. So this is the high scale, where there's a lot of railroading. So there's like a, a path where the players have to go and they can't really choose to differ a lot. There's like one direction. Um, we have a concept in, in Denmark uh, that was used a lot of years ago called 700%, where you have uh, more game masters than players. Um, so you have like maybe two players and then you have like a, a 20 game masters and a lot of people like always are like altering the game and it could be like, a, like an example would be like a kidnapping of a player. And then there would be like a whole story on top and that they know nothing and everything is like changing all the time. Um, and then I also want to say that it's hard work to make uh, a highly uh, GM game or a high scale GM game. Uh, m many edu LARPs is based on very high on the scale um, because for unexperienced players, uh, they, need, they need a lot of guiding and direction, which is what a GM offers. Um, and it's hard work to give all the direction, both in the game, but also before the game, where you prepare and you do the workshop, you explain how the game is going. Yeah. And then, of course, there's lights and sounds. This picture is taken at Delirium. Uh, and at Delirium, uh, there was a lot of lights. There was different color lights, which had different meanings. And the lights could go down, and then the scene would stop, and it could go up, and then the scene would start again. Um, so yeah, it was it was a big black box game, and they have a, then you have the GM has a lot of, of ways to push and and connect the game. There can be black box games where it's lower on the fader, but usually it's it's high on the fader because you have a lot of tools in a black box game, which can alter the direction of the game. Then you have like a, a mid scale, in the middle of the of the fader, and of course there's a picture of me. Uh, because I have to have that in every, every slide I have. Um, in the mid-scale, you would do something like have breaks in the game. You could have maybe a, a game with, with different acts. Um, there are some of the games we played here that has that. Right? Yeah. I haven't played the game, so I don't know. But Village, for instance? Yeah, Village has some kind of uh, act or dividing, shutting the game down and then you have to discuss uh, stuff. So it's, this is like, uh, this is where the GM comes in, cuts the game and then explains a new direction. Uh, but it don't actually stay in all the game. It's only like specific times the GM comes in, alters the direction a little bit. So it's not like heavy GM or game mastering. Then there's fake play. Fake play is, also, it were explained uh, earlier, but fate play is about <coughs> where you have like um, you have a fixed ending, for example, or you as a character has some kind of goal that you have to go to, um, and this kind of this kind of makes you alter your game towards this. It could be an off game goal that uh, you have to you have to kiss with another player, and then in this you will alter your game, and <coughs> and, and also the there could be like a, a cue card during the game, where the GM would hand out a card explaining something <coughs> to do. This could also, this I would also categorize as fake play. Um, you could do scripts in the play, so you could actually like hand out a script and then somebody has to say actually what is on the script. Um, Lars explained earlier that he wouldn't recommend scripts in place, and I wouldn't recommend them either. It's really hard to, to pull off and make it interesting, but it, it, can, it can flavor the game. That, that sometimes you, you put in like some kind of thing, some, a love thing from uh, Shakespeare, uh, Romeo and Juliet, some kind of sentence that they have to say, and, uh, and that will kind of 
steer the direction of the game. And then lights and music could be also used in a, maybe if the game would end with a specific song, a start with a specific song, that would set a mood. Um, but not like the, all the, the whole game. And then there's the, the low scale, or the low fader, um, where there could be, for example, no GMs at all. So as I explained before, you just hand out like the, the game and then they just play. Um, and then there's what I call intro into hands off, which is how most games, I guess, most LARPs are sort of made, where you, you have an introduction, you have a workshop, you have a briefing, you explain what's going on, and then you leave the game as a GM, and then the game, the players just play the games by themselves. Um, for this to work, uh, usually, you need to have like a really good intro and a really good introduction. You need to have a lot of workshopping and a lot of like sense of where the, the game is going or, or what the game is about. Um, and you need to have some good uh, debriefing or evaluation. Um, and then you have also, it's a, it's a good idea to have what I call a player contract. A player contract is a contract between the players that um, we have a specific expectation for the game. We have an expectation that it's going to be a fun game. This is a player contract. Then we all decide that we want to make it fun. Um, so then it's not like something that is altered, but it's just some goal we have. Um, yeah, and then to like point it out all up, up in the top in really like hardcore scale games would be like when Destiny's meet and different like festival freeform games where there's a lot of a lot of cutting and freezing and GMing and a lot of like altering the game all the time and there's heavily reloaded game where there's like only one direction and then you're always like pushed back in the in the road or in the in the way you go. So games like what it work, what is area. <laughs> or and there's the mid high scale where it's what we call G form, which I'm gonna explain a little bit about uh, in a moment. <coughs> um, and then there's the mid scale with uh, the start to finish LARPs, maybe with some breaks, uh, and then the lower, the mid lower end, where you have the classic fantasy buffer LARPs, um, which is like you introduce the player, maybe you have a homepage, um, and they go on their homepage, they read about the game, they meet up in the forest, you divide uh, some experience points or some money or something, and then you just play the game, and there's no interruptions. So that's like low in the scale. And then in the like bottom extreme, you have the GM free games. Question? Yeah? Is that how it is, or can it also, like a classic fantasy pop pop or LARP, can it also, in, like, if we say it, if we do uh, You can alter everything about altering doing yeah, the I'm game? I'm just saying a fantasy pop or LARP, could it also be a high scale game? Yeah, of course, of course. This is like, this is like this, the norm of where we put it, okay. where. You started somewhere and then you go. But of course, of course, you can make a classic, or maybe not a classic, but you can make a you can make a railroaded fantasy game oh. where everything is decided, where people go and where people do that and this and that, and they have like a lot of quests, and they have to be at the quest. They are like there are people moving them actually, like physically moving them to some kind of demon that they have to fight or stuff like that. Okay. So then it would be higher on the scale, and and of course, if you're doing like a classic buffer lord, you can alter the fader and be inspired by uh, the other games. You could have. You could have a black box fantasy LARP uh, game. So yeah, you can alter stuff. Uh, this is just like a guideline. Um, how much time do we have? Should Go do it. Okay. <laughs> I'm gonna explain a little bit about G-Form. Um, I think G-Form um, <coughs> is really, really an interesting read. I have a... Um, I have a link down there that I really recommend you to, to look at. G-Form is um, it's a method of, or it's, a, it's more like a philosophy of how to make games. Um, and they have this homepage filled with like theories and ideas and meta techniques and concepts and all that you need to know when you, when you really want to have a, a more heavy style GM game. But they also have these, they have a lot of truths or a concept or whatever. And I'm gonna read those that are, assume that your players can handle a difficult form. By form, um, it, I mean like, uh, or they mean that uh, a form is like, 
uh, GM concepts, heavy GM games, uh, genres that is kind of complicated, and, and have understanding of complex stories. They have like a, a high expectation of the player experience, or at least uh, the player's uh, capability to understand a game. Um, which, in my opinion, brings a lot more interesting games. If you think that your players are stupid, and you design your games in a direction where you think that the players are stupid, then I think the games will be more boring. And if you have, but if you have this mindset that you think that your game, that your players is really intelligent and they have a lot of uh, a good way of understanding a, a complex situation, you can have a lot more complex and interesting game. Um, and that's what Jeep sort of advocates for. <coughs> um, yeah, and that's about it.